um, we're, we're looking at it from start to finish. It starts in the mouth. Um, so when we look at lesson three, digestion in the mouth and stomach. Oh, yeah, I just started sharing my screen now. Lesson three, digestion in the mouth and stomach. It's important to realize these ideas. So uh, digestion makes the nutrients in our food accessible to the cells of our body for di that use, right? We need it to grow, develop, repair, use that food to create energy using cellular respiration. And because we are heterotrophs, we need to bring nutrients in by eating. And then when we eat, we can digest. And then when we digest, we can absorb. So that three-step process to get those nutrients into our cells is quite, quite, quite labor intensive from a, uh, a biochemical perspective. So the first thing is that we need to recognize that food needs to be broken down into smaller bits. We do that by chewing. I'll go into more detail with regards to the specifics as we go, but we chew our food. It breaks it down into smaller pieces. We then have those smaller pieces transported and absorbed by the bloodstream. So it transports down into the stomach and intestines, and it's able to be absorbed and moved around by the bloodstream. That transportation allows for cells within our entire body to have access to those nutrients. So in order to uh, get that nutrients all over the place that needs to be transported. And there's, it's every, I'll talk more about it when we get into the uh, cardiovascular system, but every single cell in your body is quite close to, to access those nutrients. No cell is more than two or three cell distances away from a direct source of nutrients, either uh, another cell, digestive tract, or the, um, or the bloodstream that transports everything around. So cells have very readily accessible. They all have access to the grocery store. Imagine you live next door to a grocery store. That's kind of how the cells are when it comes to their access for food and nutrients specifically. So um, digestion, digestion, that's something we're going to talk about quite often. It happens in the GI tract or gastrointestinal tract. This is the tract or the tube that runs inside of our body. It's the only tube, fun fact, it's the only tube that's consistently open to the external environment. So from mouth to anus, it is technically start to finish exposed to the external environment. And when you think about that for a second, you got a hollow tube running through you that's always exposed to the environment. And when I say that, I mean, you can put stuff in to your mouth and it will go all the way start to finish, right? Start to finish. And unless it's broken down or digested, it stays in that tube. So it's interesting to consider that there's a hollow tube responsible for absorbing nutrients in our body. And if you recall, if you recall with that blastospor, um, blastospor uh, formation in, um, I guess that was in unit one, right? With regards to, to mouth and anus formation, that's that tube that forms. Question on the topic, but when someone gets a gastroscopy, is that uh, exploration of the whole stomach? It's usually the, the lower digestive tract or the upper digestive tract. That's what a gastroscopy means. All right, so take a second to write this introductory component down, and then we're going to start getting into some of the ideas and the specifics of digestion.
All right. Any questions, folks, before I move on? I'm going to send off my attendance. Just double check. A couple of, a lot of check marks. Thanks, folks. Appreciate that. Oh, more check marks. Oh, beauty. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about some of the specific structures that are going to be important in understanding digestion. So the first structure that I want to talk about, teeth. One of the most important things in the digestive system are your teeth, canines, incisors, premolars, molars. All of those are responsible for crushing and mechanically digesting your food. Grinds food down, uses muscles and teeth to grind and crush food to break those larger pieces into smaller ones. This helps to prevent choking and allows for the swallowing motion to take place. All right, so teeth are quite important in the context of digestion. That's why it's so important to take care of them. I have a dentist appointment today to make sure that my teeth are healthy and happy. And while I don't always floss as much as I probably should, it's important to keep, uh, keep take to take care of your teeth. They are very responsible or very crucial for, uh, you know, they hold a lot of responsibility in the digestive system. They are first off the grid, so to speak, when it comes to digestion. All righty, the next part that we'll look at, the next part that we'll look at is saliva. Oops, let me scroll down just a such. So saliva is multifaceted in the fact that it does quite a bit with regards to digestion. It's really important in the terms of, oops, there we go. It's really important in the context of providing that, oh, I'm just having trouble with it there, ba 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 bing, ba 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 bum. There we go. It's important in, in providing, you know, that lubrication or watering effect with regards to, uh, to allowing for that swallowing action to happen. So saliva is basically water with enzymes in it. We'll learn more about this word in just a second with regards to enzymes and their importance in digestion. We'll also connect it with the idea of proteins and the uh, amino acids that we talked about, and then eventually connect it with evolution and genetics, uh, as is the the, the normal way that we do things in this class. So salivary glands make saliva, predominantly composed of water with enzymes. And this water also helps with reactions to happen uh, because as you'll start to see in digestion, saliva helps with that component of, of starch to be dissolved and broken down as early as as soon as you start to chew. So when you start to chew, imagine you're eating a piece of bread or crackers or you know, whatever it is that you, you eat that's high in starch, French fries, et cetera, the saliva and the water help to break down those starches. And it allows for not only for us to swallow that food, but the, the enzyme in saliva, which is called salivary amylase, you'll start to see this lays or A's come up often in terms of enzymes. That A's just means it's an enzyme that breaks things down. That suffix at the end of the word, again, our Latin root word, uh, root origin words, understanding how lays or A's is a suffix at the end of the word that signifies an enzyme and it breaks down. And salivary amylase breaks down starches. Remember, starches are those long polymer chains of, of carbohydrates. It breaks them down into more manageable maltose. And again, we talked about that yesterday. We'll talk about it today and consistently throughout these lessons. The idea here is that we need to break down those long chains of food and nutrients specifically, and we have to make them more manageable for the actual use in cellular respiration. So teeth and saliva are our first two adventures into digestion that we'll look at. There's a third part that I'll cover in just a second once you all finish getting some of this information down. So let me know once you are finished copying down, for those of you copying it down, 
and uh, I'll be happy to move on once we are done. And if there are any questions, as always, please let me know. Holy smoke, so many check marks. All right, many a many a check marks, many a check marks. We're ready to move on then, unless someone outright objects. No outright objections. All right, here we go. Let's look at the next component, the tongue, which is a muscle. Now, most people don't really think of the tongue as anything other than something that tastes food, but it is actually quite important in the scheme, a grand scheme of digestion. It is responsible to, for ensuring that that chewed food and saliva form what's called a bolus. A bolus is a semi-solid, partially digested mass of food. So this bolus is able to form up in the mouth. And as the tongue helps to form this bolus, it's also able to help push it back into the pharynx or the throat so that the swallowing action can take place. So when you think about chewing food and then everyone invariably always, if you're eating something right now, for example, right, that requires you to chew, think of your tongue and what it's doing and how it's able to help form that food into that mass called a bolus, which is a somewhat solid, but not quite solid, partially digested mass of food because the saliva is breaking stuff down and it allows for that bolus to form, and then it helps to push that bolus into the part of the mouth and throat that allows for the swallowing of that food to happen. So right off the bat, inside the mouth, we already have three major components of digestion happening, and they all contribute in a very crucial and important way. Because if you do not use these things to the best of your ability, uh, then digestion becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, I was always told that if you do not chew your food properly, you won't, you'll have stomach aches or you won't digest your food properly. And while it's not entirely true, um, it does, it can provide some challenges. So even though I'm, I'm bad at it and sometimes I eat like a duck too fast or without barely even chewing, uh, I try to be mindful of that chewing my food because it does help with digestion and breaking down of the food properly. So, uh, I encourage you to, as the next time you eat something, a snack, a meal, if you're eating breakfast now, consider what you're doing when you chew when you swallow and, and all of the things that are going on in your mouth that allow for that action to happen and for you to get those nutrients into your, uh, into your digestive system. All right, so take a second, ask questions. I really like talking about this part because even in, at the start of digestion, right in, 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 the, in the terms of the mouth, it's really interesting to consider um, you know, what's kind of going on. All righty, folks. Any questions, thoughts, ideas? I see a couple of check marks signifying everything's a okay.
All righty, let's move on to the next component. So I mentioned it earlier. We'll spend a bit of time talking about it now. We're going to look at what enzymes are because enzymes are crucial, crucial, crucial components in the digestive game, so to speak, because without enzymes, let me actually just zoom in a little bit. I kind of want to, oh dear. Okay, I'm going to cover up the last part. So if anyone hasn't finished it yet, please let me know. Uh, and then, all right. So enzymes, enzymes are specialized proteins. These specialized proteins, again, remember, are those proteins that we talked about earlier in this unit, as well as in last unit. The idea here are those amino acids, right, that we get from our, our nutrients. They get broken down from proteins, turned into new proteins, according to our DNA, and they help carry out chemical reactions, okay? in this case, with regards to digestion of food. Now, enzymes are important in literally, literally, I mean literally, every single metabolic process that goes on in the body, whether it's digestion, use of energy, production of energy, enzymes are ubiquitous for every single step of the game. And this, young students, is why DNA's connection to the formation of proteins is so crucial. The DNA tells our cells which proteins to make, how they should make them, and those proteins have an impact on every process within the body, which in turn produces things in such a way that allow for traits to be expressed physically. In this case, digestion of food and the ability to digest specific foods, believe it or not, is actually a trait that we can consider evolutionarily, we can consider genetically, and all of those concepts that we've learned in the previous units kind of tie in directly to this idea here that enzymes are specialized proteins that are created according to our DNA. So in this context, with regards to digestion, those enzymes are gonna help break down food and allow for digestion to kind of be a little bit more efficient. So without enzymes, many of the reactions in our bodies would happen way too slowly to keep us alive. And enzymes need to have that ability to speed things up. And in order to do that, they can only work under specific conditions. For example, temperature and pH. So um, most people, I always talk about this concept with regards to human beings. Humans love a specific temperature, right? We don't want it too hot. We don't want it too cold. And if it's too hot or too cold, we run the risk of dying because not because we're, we freeze to death, I mean, technically, yes, we do, or we, we boil to death or we're, we're overheated to death. But what's actually happening, what's actually happening is that the enzymes in our cells need to work at a specific temperature and a specific pH. And if that's thrown off too much, those enzymes stop working. And if the enzymes stop working, our body can't go through those normal processes that keep it alive. So when you consider how enzymes function, and that operational temperature that I'm going about to talk about and why it's so important to keep that, be mindful of that in the context of uh, life and death situations, really and truly when it comes to temperature, because that's why humans freeze to death or overheat to death. It's to do with that enzyme and temperatures that they operate at. So as I said, if these conditions are not met, the enzyme may denature and it will not functionally help out in those reactions and, and you know allowing for those reactions to happen efficiently and quickly. And if that happens, it can lead to some serious issues. So that's a little brief introduction into enzymes. Um, I'm gonna talk about them in a little bit more detail about how they work, but are there any questions about the general function of enzymes?
Uh, we ever cover the exact temperature and pH level that enzymes work at in grade 12, uh, in grade 12, U biology, we cover that. Yes. Not so much here. Cause in order to, to truly understand that you have to have a bit more biochemistry under your belt. And that's the first unit in grade 12 biology uh, is the biochem. And where we talk about how the amino acids forming and folding, um, why specific bonds that they create as a result of the amino acid makeup, why they're so sensitive to heat. And if, they're, if they get heat or too cold, why those bonds can break and it changes the way that that enzyme works. But we don't really get into it in this class, unfortunately. Next year, Jessica, next year. All righty. Any other questions? We're okay to move on. We're almost done this lesson, folks, believe it or not. All righty, let's move on. We'll look at a little bit of enzyme function and the general overview of how enzymes work. So important to contextually provide or important to provide some context for this. Remember, enzymes are responsible for speeding up reactions. So they help to break things down much faster than the human body without enzymes ever could. So they... They are very good at efficiently breaking down chemicals without using too much energy is, a, is the, the best way for me to say it. So how enzymes work. Step one, a substrate. So here is our substrate. A substrate binds to the reaction, to the active site. Okay. So substrate in this case, imagine you've eaten a piece of bread. Okay. Imagine you've eaten a piece of bread. That bread gets broken down. Those starches are being broken down by saliva. So you're chewing, mmm, delicious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Swallow that food. It makes its way down. Whenever it gets to the part that the enzyme is responsible for breaking it down, remember that starch has been broken down into maltose now. That maltose is the substrate, that reactant. That's the thing that's going to be broken down further. So in this case, the substrate is, we'll say maltose. Okay, we'll say that it's maltose. That maltose or the substrate goes to the enzyme's active site. The enzyme then catalyzes, fancy word for saying causes, a chemical reaction that breaks apart the substrate. So the maltose, right? The maltose, which is two single ring sugars bound together, by that oxygen, right? It gets broken apart by the enzyme. So the enzyme then releases glucose and fructose, those single ring structures, and those are what's called the products, okay? The products. The products are released into the environment and now the enzyme is able to catalyze more reactions, more maltose, because the enzyme is not consumed in this reaction. It is reused. It is using energy, a little bit of energy, to break apart those, um, those maltose things. And it breaks it apart into their constituent glucose and fructose, which we can utilize now. Okay. Does that make sense?
Oh, sorry, it's two glucose units, not two. It's two glucose molecules, not a uh, glucose and a fructose. So that maltose, which cannot be used in cellular respiration, is broken down by an enzyme through these three steps to allow that glucose to be able to be used in cellular respiration. Does everyone see how important enzymes are? Pardon me. All right. Are there any questions about enzymes, this specific functional? Uh, so with enzymes, disaccharides can break down to monosaccharides. Exactamundo. Exactly. In this case, the disaccharide of maltose gets broken down into the uh, monosaccharides of glucose and glucose. So one maltose makes two glucose as a result of enzymes breaking it down which those glucose can now be utilized in cellular uh, respiration. So as I stated above, enzymes will help to, to break down that maltose much faster than the cell could ever do that. And so it takes that catalyzed reaction and then it's able to, or it takes that, that reactant and it's able to catalyze a reaction that breaks it down at a much quicker rate. What if you consume monosaccharides? What products are formed from that? Enzymes would not need to break those down. Um, but there are very, very few things that are in, um, that are just a single molecule of glucose, right? Even when you look at sugar, like sugar crystals, right? That's, it's got a lattice work of many glucose molecules lined up and they create, for lack of a better word, a sucrose molecule that needs to be broken down by enzymes anyways. So there are, I don't really think there's anything that's in monosaccharide form, right? Like you don't just eat something that's stored as monosaccharides. It's always, always, always um, in some type of polysaccharide. What does it say after catalyze under the image? Enzyme moves to catalyze the, this is reaction. Oops. That's reaction. RxN is reaction. Yeah, no worries. All righty. So some other concepts that I want to discuss with regards to enzymes is that, you know, we see a lot of examples of enzymes in this unit with regards to digestion, but like I alluded to earlier, enzymes are going to be responsible for so many reactions beyond the actual digestive system. In many cases, enzymes are actually very important at joining substrates together to make larger products. And again, as you look at grade 12 biology specifically, you'll learn about, oops, you'll learn about some ideas um, with regards to that, but we'll look at one here today. So amylase in saliva uh, will help with digestion of, oh, let me actually, I wanna scroll down a little bit here. To, and then we'll look at the swallowing reflex as our last component. Let me just get this. Da, da, da. Ba, 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 ba. Swallowing reflex. All right, so. Let's take a look at my example in more detail that I provided earlier with regards to amylase and saliva breaking down starches in a cracker. So each enzyme has only one reaction it can catalyze. They are very, very, very specific in the job that they perform, right? Think of it like a toolbox. Um, you, you use the hammer to hammer in nails. You don't really use it to screw things in or you don't really use it to, um, to pr well, you can use it to pry things. But in this case, it's very specialized. It does one thing and one thing only. 
So each enzyme only has one reaction it can catalyze. So as I said earlier, with regards to amylase, amylase connects to that starch, okay? So that starch connects to that amylase, the starch substrate, and there's the amylase enzyme, that's the dark color there. And that starch that connects to the amylase, once it creates that substrate enzyme complex, right? Where that substrate binds to the enzyme, the enzyme can then catalyze that reaction and break down that starch into two maltose molecules, okay? And then those maltose molecules, once they make their way down into the stomach and into the lower intestinal tr intestine tract, they can be broken down further, okay? So this is just a, a pretty general overview of enzymes. Uh, I'm happy to answer any and all questions about them. So is the speed of the enzyme what determines metabolism? Kind of, yes. Not so much the speed. All enzymes function, if it's like a specific enzyme, it functions at a specific rate. But having more or less of that enzyme uh, in your body can help with regards to metabolic processes. And spoiler alert, as you get older, the sheer volume of enzymes decreases because your genetic code degrades a little bit. It's genetics. You can train your body um, like working out. Lots of exercise, marathon runners have uh, shown to improve their basal metabolic rate, but on average, it's genetics, right? Enzymes are produced as a result of, uh, of proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids, which are read off of RNA, which are read off of DNA. You can kind of impact it, like I said, right? Um, there are, are you know, Olympic athletes or people who just exercise a great deal who have shown that they can improve, raise their metabolic rate, um, but it's within a specific range, right? Like no one's able to ever true, like I'll never be able to have the metabolic processes of a, an 18 year old ever again. I could run a hundred kilometers a day uh, and my, my resting basal metabolic rate, it might improve, but it will never be as good as it was when I was young again. Uh, would having less been beneficial to our ancestors who don't have constant access to food? Yes. Yes, exactly that. It's an evolutionary. Uh, as, as food started to become more readily available, um, basal metabolic rates kind of uh, increased in some ways, right? Because when you, again, right, when you think of one interesting way to consider this is the average height and weight of a human over the last, you know, 1,000 years has drastically increased, drastically increased, right? The average height, I wanna say from 200 years ago in the 1800s, I wanna say it was like five, three, five, four, right? Everyone was pretty short. And it was because food just was not readily available, right? I, I may have been four or 500 years ago. I can't remember. Anyways, you go back far enough and the average height and weight of people was less than it is now because we are just, we have more access to food on average for our, our human race. And that impacts a lot of different factors. Uh, does that mean not exercising could decrease your metabolic rate? Um, no, it can. Yeah, it can. Like I said, right, um, I'm gonna make up a number here, but imagine like my metabolic rate right now is five, okay? If I sat and did nothing for months on end, my metabolic rate could decrease to four or four and a half. If I ran every single day, if I ran every single day, maybe my metabolic rate could rise up to five and a half or six, right? There's a range, it'll never go down to two or it'll never go up to 10 but there's a range that it can vary based on how I take care of myself and what I put into my body. And that's the case with everyone. Does that make sense? Cool. All righty. So oops. let me just get the last part primed and ready to roll. We're going to look at the swallowing reaction because most people think of it as a voluntary thing. Well, it's actually not. It's actually quite involuntary. 
And we'll talk about that in just a second. I just want to make sure that uh, this is all nice and cleaned up. Actually, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. All right, if there are any more questions with regards to enzyme and metabolic rate, I think it's a fascinating thing to talk about. Uh, I think it's interesting to consider in the context of everything that we've learned so far. Um, so yeah, if you all have any questions, I'm always happy to answer them. All righty, let's take a look at the swallowing reflex because believe it or not, the reflex that we call swallowing is what's called involuntary. It's a reaction to stimulus, meaning it happens without thought. Most people can control the reflex. Like right now, everyone, you can go like this and you can swallow saliva or the food that you're eating or what have you. But when you're actually doing the act of chewing and eating food, you don't actively be like, okay, chew, 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 time to go, swallow. You can train yourself to, to chew a little longer, but the actual reflex itself is involuntary. The reaction combines many different muscles that we have no real control over. So remember that bolus is the partially digested food. I have a couple of things underlined like epiglottis, larynx, and glottis. We'll talk a little bit about all of those things as we move through those steps of the reaction that is swallowing. So let's get into it. The first step we'll look at, step one, up here. Let me highlight, highlight it in red. Boo, step one, the soft palate the soft palate moves towards or moves to prevent the bolus. So it moves upward and it moves to prevent the bolus from entering the sinus or nasal cavity. This is in response to the bolus moving to the back of the mouth as a result of the tongue pushing it back there. Now, for those of you who have ever been unfortunate enough to laugh while eating and get food stuck up in your sinuses or up in your nose or food coming out of your nose or liquid coming out of your nose, that's because the laughing reaction causes the food to go back before the soft palate closes. So the soft palate is responsible for protecting your sinus and nasal cavity, which is connected through all of the, uh, the wind pipage that's in at the back of your no uh, nose and throat. It prevents that food from going up there. So the soft palate is now sealed the nasal cavity. Bam, happy days, we're in good shape. Step one, complete. Step two, step two. The tongue moves to prevent the bolus from re-entering the mouth. So when you swallow, again, as you eat your next meal and you think about it, when you swallow your food, your tongue actually seals up against the roof of your mouth and it prevents that bolus from going towards the front of your mouth and re-entering that mouth. Really, the next time you eat today, folks, if you're eating it right now or eating right now, thinking about that, like really when you swallow your food the next time you eat, Think about all the things that are going on in order to happen. And we don't normally think about it or control any of it. So the tongue moves to prevent the bolus from uh, entering the mouth. That's step two. And then step three. Beep. Step three is, is also quite important because if you've ever choked on food before, step three does not happen properly. So the larynx, the larynx moves up to push the glottis with the epiglottis. So this creates a nice seal up against the trachea. And that's the airway. That's the, the part of, your, of your, your neck and your throat that's responsible for allowing air to go in there. And we don't want food to go in there. So the larynx presses up against the glottis and epiglottis and it forms a sealed shut uh, tube, basically, a hatch above the airway and it prevents food from going in there. So all of these things that happen Soft plate or soft palate protecting nasal cavity, tongue closing off the mouth, and then the larynx, glottis, and epiglottis, those things closing the airway off, all of those allow for that bolus to have only one place that it can go. And that's down the esophagus, allowing the swallowing reflex to be complete. All right, folks. Questions. Oh, also one more thing here the flap of the skin is called the epiglottis. So the epiglottis and glottis are flaps of skin and the larynx is like a, a muscle bone cartilage structure that presses up against them to close those flaps to prevent food from going into your airway. And that's it. 
that's today's lesson in a nutshell. We didn't really get into too much detail with regards to digestion as a whole uh, and the step-by-step process that starts tomorrow. I really just wanted to give people an introduction into the different processes that are kind of going on with regards to, uh, or that need to happen in order for digestion to happen. Like uh, swallowing, for example, understanding the mouth, understanding how enzymes work. All of those are crucial, but not the main event, so to speak, of digestion, which we will dive into tomorrow. All right, folks. So uh, we have quite a bit of time still. We have about 30 minutes left. Uh, I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. You have no real homework today uh, outside of just reviewing some of your notes and making sure that they're all filled in. Uh, if you want to stick around and ask questions, I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Um, yeah. That's pretty much it. I'm going to make a post on Classroom later today about an event that's happening um, with regards to uh, I think some stuff that a lot of you could utilize or, or, or make use of with regards to, you know, developing better study habits. And um, <coughs> as I choke on saliva because my glottis and epiglottis didn't properly seal. <coughs> um, so I'll make that post on Classroom today and then I'll talk more about it tomorrow. I'll pump it up a bit more formally tomorrow. And uh, yeah, if there's uh, other questions about the little brief introduction into digestion, please let me know. Uh, has there ever been an issue where the epiglottis wasn't pushed properly so food did go down the trachea? Yeah, that's what happens when you choke on food. If you've ever if you've ever inhaled food or choked on food before, had, you know, you see it in the movies where someone gets something stuck in their windpipe and they're uh, and they need the Heimlich or the J maneuver to happen. Um, yeah, they need to do that. So why would that happen? Great question, Mateo. Um, what happens is, oh no. It doesn't really go into the lungs, no. Because the trachea, there are involuntary muscles along the trachea that actually stop and close things up if anything solid gets in there. Um, but it, it happens because people breathe too quickly or are chewing their food and, and trying to swallow their food too quickly. And this, the act of that happening, the, the epiglottis takes a bit of time to, to close, but the soft palate and the tongue, they move pretty quickly. So if you inhale too suddenly in the act of just about to swallow, the, the trachea doesn't have time to close the glottis and epiglottis and food can go in there. Um, so, but the, the way that the trachea works, it's able to close off before anything gets past that, but it can get lodged at the entrance way of your trachea, which causes people to choke. Uh, that's a question. I'm not sure if you can answer it already, but is it possible to choke on your tongue? No, well, yes. Uh, in certain disorders or in certain um, um, certain muscle issues that people might have, seizures, it can happen in seizures and it can happen in, in a couple of other things, but the muscle re can relax and it can start to close off the, um, it can start to push the epiglottis against your, so I'll zoom in and see if I can, the tongue muscle here, if it relaxes too much, let me, let me highlight it here. If it relaxes too much, like in this region here, it can put weight on the epiglottis, thus closing off your, uh, your trachea and preventing you from breathing. So yeah. So like I said, folks, that is it. If you want to stick around and ask some questions, by all means, I'm going to post the video in just a second for those of us that are unable to see it. And hopefully later on today, they'll be able to take a look at it. Uh, and yeah, if you have any questions you want to stick around and ask, I'm more than happy to see if I can answer them about digestion or the the, the inner workings of, of the mouth, esophagus, and enzymes. Otherwise, folks, if you are heading out, enjoy your morning. Bye, Mr. Kiedis. So have a great day. Bye, Matthew. Take care. You're welcome, Katie. Bye, Olivia. Bye, Colin. Bye, Emma. Bye, Anna. Bye, Vicky. Bye, Mateo. Bye, Stanley. Bye, Dean. Bye, Valeria. Bye, You're welcome. You too. you too, Rocco. Take care. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Krish. <whistles> Bye, Daniela.
Yeah, sure thing. Let me get up to Amelie's. So what happens? Starch, right? The starch that's in bread or cracker or any high starch potatoes, what have you, right? It's that long polymerase chain. That starch is able to bind into the amylase enzyme. And once it binds, the enzyme is able to break this. Let me get the arrow apart. It's able to break this bond in starch, right? It's a very special type of bond. Um, it's an ester bond, that oxygen. And it breaks it down by adding water in, for lack of a better word. So that's why it's so important that saliva be comprised of water. Amylase uses water to break that starch down into those maltoses. So once water is added, you can even see it here, this tiny little water molecule right there. Water is used to break down that starch and then that breaks that oxygen bond and it forms two maltose molecules. So the enzyme just really is like, um, it's like a broker. I don't know if you know what that word is, but it just kind of helps things happen a little faster. It draws the starch in, it draws attention to the water, and then the water breaks it down and allows for that maltose to be formed. Does that make a bit more sense? Did you have any specific questions about it? In the chart, it says enzyme salivary amylase. Is that the same thing in this example? Yeah, because amylase is um, amylase can happen. There's many different forms of amylase. There's salivary amylase. There's intestinal amylase. Um, so that prefix is just to say where it exists. Uh, is amylase a polysaccharide? No, amylase is not a polysaccharide. Amylase is a protein. It's a protein made of amino acids shaped in a very special way that allows for it to break down polysaccharides. Because enzymes are always made up out of protein. So the products are maltose, do those get broken down even more? Yeah, later on though. We'll look at that when we talk about it in the, uh, in the small intestine. Yeah, that maltose gets broken down into glucose further. Does the A's, laser A's, yeah, A's, this, this basically means, so, so this means to break down with water or with some type of, yeah, I won't get into, it's basically, it's the, it catalyzes a redox reaction, which uh, you don't know what that means quite yet, but um, yeah, it, grade 12 chemistry and in grade 12 biology, you learn a bit more about it, but it's, it's allowing for water to be utilized or other, other chemical compounds to be broken down or break down using those. And the amylase, A's is just like, oh, hi, I'm the thing that helps you break stuff down. That's what the, the direct translation, I guess, means. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Cool. You as well, Jessica. Enjoy your day. Talia, are you there still? Did you have any questions? All righty. Oh, see you later.